this is going to be the next episode of God's Game of Thrones. We've been looking at the kings. Some of the most interesting studies in all the Bible come from these books of the kings. In 1 Kings chapter 22 and 2 Chronicles chapter 18, you're going to see an alliance. Jehoshaphat is going to join affinity with Ahab. This means they're going to become best buds because it's going to benefit them in some worldly way. But first, I want to give you some background for both kings to once again familiarize you with who they actually are so you're not just going into this blindly. So I want to give you a quick review of who King Ahab is. Ahab is the seventh king of Israel. His name means brother of father. The length of his reign is 22 years. His spiritual state is evil. He's one of the most evil kings in the Bible. His father's name is Omri, who was also an evil king. The prophets that prophesy during his time is Elijah and Micaiah and some other unknown prophets. He ruled during the 30th year of Asa and continues into the reign of Jehoshaphat. You can find Ahab in 1 Kings 16 through 1 Kings 22. You also find him in 2 Kings 3, 5, 2 Chronicles 18 through 19. Now next, you got Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat is Judah's fourth king. His name means Jehovah is judge. The length of his reign is 25 years. He's from the tribe of Judah. His parents are Asa, which is his father, and his mother's name is Azuba. And the prophets that prophesied during his, ta his days are Elijah, Elisha, Micaiah, Jehaziak, and Eliezer. Uh, he ruled during the reign of Israel's kings Ahab, Ahaziah, and Jehoram. And you find Jehoshaphat mainly in 1 Kings chapter 22 and in 2 Chronicles 17 through 22. Okay, now let's get into it. Look at 1 Kings 22, 1 through 4. It says, And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, Know ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria? And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth and Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thou art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. So Jehoshaphat is a good king, but this is where he makes a big mistake. Look there at 1 Kings 22, 4. Jehoshaphat tells Ahab, he says, I am as thou art. He says, my people as thy people. That couldn't be any further from the truth. Jehoshaphat was a good king that cared about the things of God, and Ahab was the opposite. He had different morals and values. Jehoshaphat pictures the Bible-believing Christian who wants to make unity with people that he has no business making unity with. And if you go over and read 2 Chronicles 18, then you will notice that it's another account of the same story here in 1 Kings 22. And it says in 2 Chronicles 18, 1 and 2, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. He's already got riches. He's already got honor and abundance. He's already on the Lord's side. He's got the Lord on his side. Why would he need to join affinity with Ahab? And it says, And after certain years he went down to Ahab to Samaria, and Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance, and for the people that he had with him, and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. So you're going to have... You're going to have people that don't have any morals, don't have any values, and they, they try to win you over, maybe by giving you things, 
maybe by promising you something. Ahab was giving him sheep and oxen in abundance. Jehoshaphat already had riches and honor in abundance. What more would he need? He's already got the Lord. He could look over at Ahab and say, well, he's got a lot of things, but I've got a lot of things. But I've got the Lord, and he doesn't have the Lord. And it says in Second Chronicles 18, 3, And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. So Jehoshaphat tells wicked king Ahab, that he's going to be with him in the war. Now you shouldn't go and fight your wars with wicked men. You shouldn't, you know, join up with them. Because you're going to lose, you end up losing the war if you do that. It says, And Ahab king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people. And we will be with thee in the war. Now that we have the context settled, I want to talk about a certain topic while we go through these chapters, and that is knowing real preaching. Number one, real preaching uses the word of the Lord. In 1 Kings 22, 5, it says, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, to Ahab, he says, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. Notice the first thing Jehoshaphat wanted to do was inquire at the word of the Lord. And that is not what is on Ahab's mind. Why does Jehoshaphat feel the need to unite with someone that doesn't have any regard for the words? You see, it's hard for a Bible believer to fellowship with a worldly Christian or with a lost person because the words are not held up high enough in the eyes of that person. Notice the prophets that Ahab king of Israel gathers together. These are men that do not use the words of the Lord. In 1 Kings 22, 6, Then the king of Israel, which is Ahab, gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said unto them, Shall I go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up. For the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. You see, if Ahab had a cloning device and cloned Stephen Furtick about 400 times, then that is what you would have here. 400 people pretending to be on the Lord's side and only bringing a soft, watered-down message. They either use a little bit of the words of God and change it, add to it, subtract from it, water it down, make it not seem as severe, or they just don't even use it, period. And if you hear the average teaching and preaching today, they don't give enough of the of the Bible to fill up a baby ant's stomach. I mean, they can't feed anybody spiritually. And if you combined everything their pastor said from the Bible in one year and molded it together, it couldn't form a cheesy roll-up from Taco Bell. It couldn't feed you that much. It couldn't fill up a Happy Meal box. If his sermon was a kid's meal at McDonald's, all it would be is the toy. There would be no meat, no french fries, no apple slices, no chocolate milk. You couldn't even say that they have a milk ministry. It's more like a ministry of bottled water that's set around in your car for about a week. You know that taste, how bad it tastes. If you've ever got extremely thirsty at work and then you or you see a water bottle in the car, it's sit there for a week and you drink it, you know how horrible that tastes? If you're a Bible believer, then you know exactly what I'm talking about listening to these very watered-down sermons or teachings. You know the difference. Jehoshaphat knows the difference. Notice what Jehoshaphat says when Ahab brings out all these false prophets and he hears the preaching of these false prophets. It says, and Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? You see, Jehoshaphat knows the difference between real preaching and a bunch of fakers that are just worried about offending the king. He says, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord 
definitely implying that those other prophets were not of the Lord. They were obviously of Baal. If they were here today, then their idea of biblical, of true biblical Christianity to them is a Kanye West concert. Really. If these false prophets were here today, they would think the greatest Christian work going on today is Chick-fil-A because they're closed on Sunday. In 1 Kings 22, 8, it says, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he, hath, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. So even Ahab knows those 400 aren't of the Lord. Because he says there is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Imla. You see, Ahab hates him because he never prophesies good concerning him. You see, there is the problem. Ahab doesn't care about truth. This is why no unity should be made with Ahab. None. He would rather hear a positive message from the majority than to hear what the Lord has to say from his one man. And in 1 Kings 22, 8, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah the son of Imla, by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. And Jehoshaphat said, Let the king say so. Jehoshaphat is like, Oh, don't be like that king. Bring him out. Let's hear what he have to, has to say. And that's going to bring us to our next point. Real preaching doesn't fit in. There was one man against 400. Ahab said there is yet one man. And those 400 were clones of each other. The same watered down positive message. Micaiah stood out as something different. Real preaching stands out because it is different than the average. And when a man is in the book, he becomes an individual. He doesn't have to fit in to be right with the Lord. It says in 1 Kings 22, 9, Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah the son of Imla. So he was probably in jail and getting called out to preach a, a big meeting here right out of jail. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria, and all the prophets prophesied before them. So it's like Jehoshaphat is sitting there and watching TBN, hearing all these false prophets. Most of it was probably sending, about sending in donations. And it says, And Zedekiah the son of Canana made him horns of iron, and he said, Thus saith the Lord, With thee shalt thou push the Syrians until thou have consumed them. So, Zedekiah here, he's got these horns, a symbol of power, and he was a false prophet spewing out the lie. He's, he's spewing out the lie that they are going to consume the Syrians. So he's going right along with, with all these other false prophets here. But then you're going to see Micaiah come out. It says in 1 Kings twenty two twelve, 12, And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Bramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the king's hand. Notice that word prosper. All the big dog preachers talk about how you can prosper and be in prosperity. In 1 Kings twenty two thirteen, 13, And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. What is the point of calling Micaiah in to preach the same sermon as those 400 lying prosperity prophets? The truth is not popular, and this messenger knew that Micaiah would go in there and give the truth. So he says, let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. 
And in Isaiah 30, verses 9 through 11, it says that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. So they say, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. They would rather hear a lie than to hear the truth because the truth hurts. And Micaiah wasn't the smooth type of preacher. He was the truth-seeking, roughneck, enemy of all that is wicked type of preacher. He would preach a sermon on the man being the head of the home to a stadium full of feminists. I mean, he would uh, preach a sermon against abortion full of a stadium of abortion doctors. You know, that's just how he was. It says in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. You see, the truth doesn't fit in when your life is based on lies and feelings and personal experiences and the news and newspapers and fact checkers. 1 John 3.13 says, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you. Don't think it's strange when the world hates you because you stand up for the truth. John 15.18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The devil's hate list includes everybody but himself. But I believe there are people on the front page of the hate list that's highlighted in red, and those are the ones who really, who he really wants dead. Micaiah would be one of those guys. And if the devil had a picture of a face on the wall in his office for dart throwing, it would be Micaiah and Elijah at this time. Maybe you today, if you're standing up for the words of the Lord, the spirit in Ahab hates real preaching. And the devil, he, he's full of the devil. He is a child of disobedience. In 1 Kings twenty two fourteen, And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So this goes back to point number one. Real preaching uses the word of the Lord. That should be what we live by. We don't need to say what the Lord saith unto me, I mean, we do need to say what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. That's what we need to say. First Peter 4.11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. First Kings 22.15 So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. So he says the same message as the false prophets. But you notice Micaiah is being sarcastic. Real preaching will allow the preacher to use his personality. Micaiah is sarcastic. He is a, that type of guy. He's trying to get under the skin of Ahab. And you can tell they know each other pretty well because Ahab said that he hated him already. You see, this is humor in the Bible. Ahab's like... Tell us, Micaiah, what shall we do? And he says, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver into the hand of the king. I can just imagine the smirk on Micaiah's face when he looks into Ahab's eyes with the watered-down prosperity gospel and just gets completely sarcastic with him here and tells him the same message that the 400 false prophets gave. Now notice what Ahab says next. I imagine with a frustrated and devil-possessed glare in his eyes, he says in verse 16, And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? You see, this is, this is humor in the Bible. Micaiah knows what the people want him to say, and he knows what, they, what Ahab wants him to say. He knows it isn't the word of the Lord. The crazy thing is that even Ahab knows the prophets are full of it. He knows Micaiah is a real prophet and that his message is going to be negative. You see, doom and gloom preachers are the most biblical. You know, it's kind of like my pastor. You know, we'll all come in on like a Mother's Day Sunday and they'll hand, hand out gifts to all the moms there in the service. 
and it's a real happy atmosphere. And then Donnie will preach on hellfire. It's just, it's a, it's a funny turn of events there. You know, he gives a doom and gloom negative message because I guess a lot of people were, a lot of people were expecting a sweet Mother's Day sermonette that day. And he gets up in there and preaches on hellfire. That's like Micaiah. He's coming in after a real positive message. Go up to Raymond Gilead and prosper. He gets in there and says, he's going to say, you know, you're going to die if you go in. So now Micaiah is, is done playing around with Ahab. And here's what he's going to say in 1 Kings twenty two seventeen, And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. Notice part of the prophecy is, These have no master. Their master would be Ahab. So part of the prophecy is that Ahab is nothing but a dead man walking. 1 Kings twenty two eighteen, 18, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? You can't please someone like Ahab. He didn't give... He didn't like the sarcastic message that Micaiah my, my gave first, and he doesn't like the real message that he's, he's giving either. Sometimes people intentionally avoid going to hear a preacher in town because they know what he's going to say will rub them the wrong way. I've heard preachers cuss before, and while I don't agree with cussing, I would rather hear a man cuss in righteous indignation than to hear someone who never says anything true ever. Or acts like everything's okay all the time. You see, real preaching just doesn't fit in. Real preaching, number three, real preaching is done by someone who is consistently thinking about the spirit world. Look at what Micaiah says next in 1 Kings twenty two nineteen, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Micaiah isn't done. Micaiah can see the third heaven. He's standing there letting, letting it rip in front of these two kings without respect of persons. Just like my pastor does. If a big shot comes in, he'll jump up on the pews and use the big shot's head to balance himself while he's up there. Micaiah comes, comes out of lockup and he looks those kings in the face and now he's going to remind them about the real king. He doesn't draw attention to himself. He draws attention to the only one that deserves the attention. He says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. He's like, you guys may have your cute little thrones and robes down here, but I see the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. He saw the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending. He saw the throne in heaven where the Ancient of Days did sit. Imagine how much you would be ready to be offered and for your time of departure to be at hand if you saw God sitting on his throne like Micaiah saw it, like Stephen saw it, like the Apostle Paul saw it. A lot of preachers today will neglect talking about heaven and hell and spiritual warfare against devils and fallen angels and how God uses the angels of heaven and all the unseen forces at work. They'll neglect all that stuff. But there is more going on in the spirit world than there is in this world. There are more beings in the spirit world than there are in this world. Think about all the people in hell that you can't see. Think about all the people in heaven you can't see. Think about an innumerable company of angels. The lack of preaching and teaching on spiritual warfare has got people under the spell of believing that there is no war going on, spiritually speaking, at all. A lot of people don't even believe that devils are at work today. And I've heard some men in person who believe that the devil is presently chained in the bottomless pit right now. Most people think angels are half-naked babies with wings or that they look like a hot blonde that they just saw at Hooters or something. Because the average preacher or teacher won't show them the Bible view of the spirit world. They are afraid they will look too far out there. They stick with the practical stuff. This is because... People have their heads stuck in their own life 
so much that they don't want to hear anything that goes beyond this physical world. They, they just want preaching on how to cope, how to stay married, how to react to your neighbor, and just a little bit less than the milk of the word. All that stuff is good, but there is a, a big, big Bible to get into. There's a big Bible out there. Most people have absolutely no idea about the deep and secret things in the word. But Micaiah, he's preaching and he sees the Lord in heaven and describes something he sees in the spirit world. And I do believe that heaven is a real physical place, but it's inhabited by spirit beings and the souls of the saved. In 1 Kings twenty two twenty, and the Lord said, Micaiah is seeing this, and he sees the Lord say, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. So Micaiah sees the Lord up in heaven, asking who will go persuade Ahab, so that he will go up, he will go on up to Ramoth Gilead and die. First Kings twenty two twenty one. And there came forth the spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. So a lying spirit has access to the third heaven, and God's going to give him the opportunity to wreak havoc on earth. Because there has to be judgment brought on Ahab. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. So it seems the devil and unclean spirits, just like as in Job chapter 1 and Job chapter 2, need permission from God before they can do anything. And notice some extra detail in Second Chronicles 18. The lying spirit says something else. In Second Chronicles 18, 20 through 21, there came out a spirit. There, then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, wherewith? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, thou shalt entice him. And thou shalt also prevail, go out and do even so. Notice that word entice. They want to entice you. James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Spiritual wickedness will entice you. If you don't stay conscience, conscious of spiritual wickedness in high places that Ephesians 6 talks about, then they may leave you in big trouble. In 1 Kings twenty two twenty three, it says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. Notice the lying spirit is connected with the mouth. It says, I, He hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets. Just like in Revelation sixteen thirteen, when John sees unclean spirits, like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophets, of the, the false prophet. Words are like spirits. They're connected to spirits. And some words that may only be spoken for a moment can have a lasting effect. They can play over and over in someone's mind. They can be embedded in, on the heart of a person for good or evil for the rest of their life. But Micaiah, he saw all of this unfold in the third heaven. And the Lord himself puts a lying spirit in the mouth of the false prophets. The Lord would deceive people as a judgment because they've rejected the truth. Second Thessalonians 2.11, it says, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And Second Thessalonians 2.12, That all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. So real preaching is conscience, conscious of the spirit world. Number four, real preaching brings persecution. In 1 Kings twenty two twenty four through 25, But Zedekiah, Zedekiah, the son of Canaanah, went near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see in that day. When thou shalt go in 
and shall go into an upper chamber, an inner chamber, to hide thyself. Notice the swift comeback. He said, you'll see in that day when you're going to hide with your tail between your legs. The preaching of Micaiah led him to getting a smack in the face. But notice he doesn't try to hit him back. He's too tough for that. Someone who has the truth doesn't need to hit a lost person back. It's like when your toddler punches you in the nose. You know, I'm not going to hit him back. He doesn't have any sense. Micaiah isn't going to hit this guy back in the face. He doesn't have any sense either. It says in 1 Kings twenty two twenty six, And the king of Israel said, Take Micaiah and carry him back unto Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. So Micaiah got called out of jail to preach a meeting, and now he's got to go back. And verse 27 says, And say, Thus said the king, Put this fellow in the prison, and feed him with bread of affliction and water of affliction, until I come in peace. So Micaiah is put in prison for telling the truth, and this is coming to a town near you sooner than we probably think. And the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Number five, real preaching has prophecy that comes to pass. You see, in the day and age we're living in, you have liars and crazy people and frauds and money-hungry posers pretending to prophesy. And you'll notice a trend that they say never, the things they say never actually comes to pass. And if it does, remember that even a broken clock is right two times a day. Real preaching has prophecy that comes to pass. Do you know why? Because real preaching only preaches the prophecy that's already written down in the scriptures. Your pastor can, can come in and jump up on the pulpit and say, Mystery Babylon is going to fall. You know why? Because that's written down in Revelation 17 and 18. A man can prophesy all, all he wants to. He just better make sure those prophecies are in the scriptures. We can say, if you don't get saved, then hell is in your future. That's prophesying. I'm predicting a lost person's future because the Bible already said that. The Bible already lets us know that a lost person is going to hell if they don't get saved. That's prophesying. And we know that is for certain because the scriptures tell us that. But you got to watch out for people that's always saying this or this is going to happen. And they don't even get it out of the Bible. Ahab thinks he's going to come back in peace. But look what Micaiah says in 1 Kings twenty two twenty eight. And Micaiah said, if that were to return at all in peace, the Lord hath not spoken by me. And he said, hearken, O people, every one of you. So Ahab thinks he is coming back in peace, but Micaiah tells him that the only way he's coming back in peace is if he himself is a false prophet. So he's like, if you come back in peace, then the Lord hath not spoken by me. In other words, if you come back alive, then I'm a false prophet myself. So Ahab is enticed by that lying spirit to go on up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper. In 1 Kings 22, 29 through 30, So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, went up to Ramoth Gilead. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. So you're going to see that Micaiah's prophecy does come to pass. But first, what in the world is going on here? Ahab is going to disguise himself and so that he doesn't look like a king. And Jehoshaphat is going to dress up like a king even more. Can you see how Ahab is playing Jehoshaphat? How does Jehoshaphat not see it? Is he so blinded because he's trying to see the good in people? And Number five, real preaching warns you of worldly alliances. In other words, quit hanging out with lowlifes like Ahab. Jehoshaphat has got himself in a situation where he's going out to battle to look like the one person that the enemy wants dead, which is Ahab. Look at verse 31. But the king of Syria commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariots, saying, Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel. So the only, the only person they're going after is Ahab. And the one who looks like Ahab is not Ahab, it's Jehoshaphat. 
And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him, and Jehoshaphat cried out. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Jehoshaphat just dodged a bullet on this one. And notice the great detail that it adds in Second Chronicles 18.31. It says, And it came to pass when the captains of the chariot saw Jehoshaphat, that they said, It is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But Jehoshaphat cried out, And the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. Wow, that's a great detail in Second Chronicles 18. The Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from Jehoshaphat. If the Lord really doesn't want you dead, you're not going to die. But isn't it something that Jehoshaphat started hanging around Ahab so much that to the sinful world, the Syrians here, he looked just like Ahab. As a Christian, if you just hang around any sorry old thing all the time, then you're going to end up looking just like that sorry old thing you're hanging out with. They'll get you mixed up with him. Jehoshaphat was hanging out with Ahab he ends up looking just like Ahab to the sinful world. That will be your future. If you continue hanging out with people you shouldn't hang out with. And if you're already in that situation, cry out to God just like Jehoshaphat did and turn yourself around. Do a 180. You know, get with it. Start acting like a saint. But now the prophecy is going to come to pass. If you've been following along with this story at all, then it probably looked like Ahab was going to get away and that Micaiah was actually a false prophet. But remember, God's word will come to pass even when it looks like it's not going to come to pass. So it says in 1 Kings twenty two thirty four, And a certain man drew a bow at a venture and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Wherefore he said unto the driver of his chariot, Turn thine hand and carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. Even though Ahab disguised himself, he still dies. The prophecy from the Lord was going to be fulfilled, and there was nothing he could do to change it. A man drew a bow at a venture. He just randomly shot it, and it got Ahab between the joints of the harness. He even weaseled past his armor and got it in there. God was behind that arrow. He is the greatest archer that ever existed. He's never not hit the bullseye. He's always on target. It says in 1 Kings twenty two thirty five, 35, And the battle increased that day. And the king was stayed up in his chariot against the Syrians and died at even. And the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. He thought he was getting away. He thought he could disguise himself and hide himself from the Lord. But you can't disguise yourself and make yourself not be seen by the Lord. Adam and Eve tried to hide. They couldn't hide from the Lord. And there went a proclamation throughout the host about the going down of the sun, saying, Every man to his city and every man to his country. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor, according unto the word of the Lord which he spake, now the rest of the acts of Ahab and all that he did and the ivory house which he made and all the cities that he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? And then Second Chronicles 18.34 says, And the battle increased that day. Howbeit the king of Israel stayed himself up in his chariot against the Syrians until the even and about the time of the sun going down, and he died. So Ahab dies. The word of the Lord came to pass. Ahab did a lot in his life. He wasn't lazy. He was busy for the devil. He built houses for himself. He built cities. He fought in battles, but he was an evil worker. But the Bible says Ahab slept with his fathers, and Ahaziah his son reigned in his stead. The wicked die just like the righteous die. And the righteous die just like the wicked die. Ahab should have listened. To Micaiah. He should have listened way before this. You know, God still gave him a free will. He had free will all this time, but eventually his 
consistent rejecting of the words of the Lord over time led him to be in a situation where the Lord allowed a false prophet to come down and entice him. A false prophet with a lying spirit in his mouth to entice him, to be exact. And Ahab falls for it. He goes on into the battle, disregards what Micaiah says, and he ends up dead. Ahab could have turned it around. He could have been a good king. He could have been a Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat was a good king. He could have went back the other, other direction and not been so shacked up with Ahab that he started looking just like him. That's what this story is a picture of. It's a picture of a saint joining affinity with someone of, of the lost world or of, uh, you know, like a backslid Christian group and getting so involved with them that they end up looking just like them in the sinful world cannot tell the difference between that saint and the world. And that's a horrible testimony for you. That's what Lot did. He started looking just like the sinful world so much that he seemed like, he was mocking when he came to warn his sons-in-law that judgment was coming on Sodom. But this has been the story of King Jehoshaphat joining affinity with Ahab.